All right. Um, hi. So um, a couple of weeks ago, I started playing with this thing called Shader Toy, which some of you might have heard of. Um, and so I just thought it could be interesting to graphics people to hear a little bit about it. So this is a presentation on um, the small shader toy project that I made. Um, so first of all, what is Shader Toy? Shader Toy is a website, shadertoy.com, shader toy uh, on which you can create shader pages like this one. So on the left, you have your image, and on the right, you have your code. So your job, basically, is just to write a pixel shader. So it's just a function that gets evaluated for every pixel uh, in the image on the left, and that determines the color of your pixel. Very simple. Um, and you can't. You probably cannot see here, but the, the main function in your code is really just taking as input the coordinates of the pixel and as it, it outputs a color. Um, so that's really all there is to it. You also have uh, a couple more um, data that you can use. As you see, this is animated, so you need to have a notion of time. So you have access to um, a global time variable. Um, and there are, there are also a couple of textures that you can use. Um, these are all the textures that you can use inside of Shader Toy. So you have a bunch of uh, noise function, just basic materials, um, some cube maps for your environments. Uh, but that's it. There's no way for you to add your textures to Shader Toy. So it's a bit constraining. There's not really a lot of information that you can use. Uh, but as you can see, you can still generate some uh, very nice uh, animations with it. Um, so really the first difficulty that you um, that you um, hit when you start time and the predefined textures to render everything. Um, so if you're used to have like a data-oriented pipeline where you just push a triangle mesh through a pipeline and you get an image, or with optics where you, you push again triangles through a pipeline, um, that's just not going to work here because you don't have access to this triangle data. Um, so you're left with using either uh, 2D constructions or ray tracing um, to generate your images. So when I say 2D constructions, it's something like this. So this is just a small toy, shader toy that I made, um, where I just take the coordinates of a pixel and I rescale everything to have the, the correct aspect ratio and that it's centered correctly. Um, I compute the center of those uh, two circles. That's just a function of, of time. Um, and then I compute the red, green, and blue value of the pixels as the red value is, uh, is the pixel inside the red circle, yes or not. Same thing for the green, and for the blue value, I just use the Y coordinate of the pixel um, to create a small gradient. So just by using those very simple 2D tricks, um, you can start generating shapes in your images, and you can start playing around with it. And um, actually, just staying in 2D, you can generate some very nice demos. This is by uh, Inigo Quiz, which is one of the creators of Shader Toy, and uh, basically a god in the demo uh, community. Um, so it's there's no tree, nothing 3D here, it's just 2D stuff, but it still looks uh, very cool. Um, if you want to go to 3D, you can either go with uh, ray tracing, or but people usually use uh, ray marching. So it's the usual thing. You, this grid of pixel, you just imagine it as being in 3D. That's your view plane. And so for every pixel, you draw a ray um, through the pixel. Um, but with ray marching, as David explained a little bit, um, what you do first, instead of computing the, inter the intersections, is that you uh, compute this function that tells you at any point in space what is the uh, closest distance to any object in my scene. So what you see here, as I have very skillfully drawn, is um, the contours of these functions. So what you do is you trace your ray, uh, advance it a little bit for, uh, after the, the view plane, compute the, the distance there. Um, and so here I, I compute that the closest object is at the distance of five. So I know that if I advance my array by a distance of five, there's no way I'm going, I'm going to hit anything. So I just advance by five, recompute the distance function, and I can just converge like this slowly to an object, and at some point I hit something, or I'm very close to something, and that gives me the color of my pixel. Um, so what's the advantage of ray marching instead of ray tracing? Ray tracing, um, you're stuck with usually using very um, uh, basic primitives like, like sphere and planes um, because you need to be able to compute the, inter the intersection exactly with your objects. Um, so if you try to ray trace something like this, um, 
because of this sign term here, you won't be able to exactly compute the intersection, and so it's a lot more complicated. But uh, with ray marching, you can still evaluate the distance to this object, or at least uh, have an approximation to it, and so you're still able to converge uh, to this object, and so you're able to intersect with it. And um, there's a lot of tricks that you can use actually with ray marching. So uh, in this example, say you want to have just an infinite array of spheres in your scene uh, that extend in the x direction. If you were to use ray tracing, you'd, you'd have to intersect every single one of those spheres or use some kind of tricks. Um, but with ray marching, all you need to do is just to be able to evaluate this distance function. So because everything is periodic in the x direction, you can just take your x, take the modulus to go back to like the sphere that's centered in your domain, and, and then you just evaluate the distance to this single sphere. So um, this is one trick that's used a lot, especially in Shader, in shader Toy, because you can just multiply your geometry um, to infinity. And uh, you can do that without having to modify your ray marching code. So it's very, very easy to implement and very efficient. And ray marching is also very good if you want to do some constructive solid geometry. So here I have uh, into the a square and a circle, and I have the sine distance function. I use that the positive distance if I'm inside the shape and the negative distance if I'm outside the shape. Um, so you can just use Boolean operations on those uh, shapes by just taking either the max or the minimum or the minimum of the negative um, of those. So just si very simple composition of the distance functions will give you the Boolean operations on your shape. So right away you can start just um, putting shapes together and making holes and everything without having to modify ever your marching code. So, it's, so especially for prototyping, um, it's very cool. All you need to modify is this distance function, and you can do whatever you want. So even if you have very simple operations, you see people kind of go crazy. Um, this is by John Kornhofer. Um, so it's a set of interlocking uh, gears, and they're all aligned in a, on a Mobius strip kind of structure. Um, and this all moves. There's, it's very amazing. Um, but this is really just a combination of two cylinders here, and I have one of th these um, teeth here that is just, re just repeated using this modulus trick that I, that I showed. And then you, co you build one gear, and you again repeat it using the modulus trick around the ring, and you get this structure. It's actually not that complicated to construct, and it's not very complicated to evaluate either, because wherever you are, you always uh, go back, just by computing the modulus, you always go back to your main gear, which is maybe this one. So you can construct a lot of nice geometry very quick, very quickly. And then the second difficulty of using shader toy is that it's completely stateless. So there's no way to store any information in your scene. So if I, uh, of course you have access to time, but that doesn't mean that there can be continuity in your frame. So if I give you just a random time, you have to give me a frame. It has to be the same uh, independently of the, the order on which I give you the times. So that raises a lot of questions. Um, how do you do physics? Um, say you have rigid bodies, usually you just update their position in space, but that's not something you can do here because you don't know what the position of the previous frame was. Um, how do you do camera control? So if you want to have a character moving in your scene, you can't really do it because you'd have to store the camera position, so that's not going to work. So in general, um, anything that has causality or continuity is a priori, a priori not going to work. But the shader dog community is very creative, and people are still able to do stuff like this. So this is Super Mario Brothers, first level, entirely done in a pixel shader. Um, first time I, I saw that, it just completely blew my mind, especially because it's 100% stateless. So how can you create uh, such a continuous and this impression that someone is playing um, if you don't have any states? Um, and so for instance, how do you know how to, at what height do you render this Mario sprite? Um, so the X, finding the x-coordinate of Mario is not too bad, it's just a linear function of time, and you can just shift the whole scene uh, with his position, so that's not a problem. But the height, if you, usually in a, video, in a video game like that, you have a state, like um, is Mario in the air or not, and is he like going up or down, that kind of stuff. Um, so to simulate that, what he did is somewhere in the code, you have hard-coded all of the times where Mario actually starts jumping, 
and you also have the, uh, the scale of the jump, so the, basically the height of the jump. So what that means is that you, the, the, the height of Mario is actually now a function of time that you can evaluate at, at any given time. You just look, am I in a, in a jumping frame? If yes, when was the starting time? And you, then you evaluate this parabola, and it works. It's super complicated, and it's not very, uh, the code is a bit uh, cumbersome, but it works. Same thing for those Koopas. So there's a time where Mario jumps on a Koopa and then it gets squished. Um, so all you have to do is hard code it somewhere in the code. Uh, the time of death of every Koopa is somewhere in the code. So you know, okay, if I'm before 1050, I have to render this Koopa full size. And if I'm after 1050, I have to render it squished. So it's really just a, a different way of thinking where you have to really pre-compute everything. Um, and you have to be really, really clever on like, how you generate the stuff that would be just trivial to do if you have, if you had the ability to store states. Um, and and the, the other thing that's amazing with the shader is that uh, there are just so many things that are rendered that um, are very difficult to render. This is a sprite, but you don't have any textures, you don't have any data. There's not a file on disk that gives you like the, the bitmap. So how do you do it? Um, Again, if you look in the code, there's this beautiful function called Sprite Cloud that takes care of generating the cloud. Um, so what you have here is for every Y value in the, in the cloud sprite, so for every height, um, it gives you an integer. And then it feeds this integer into this Sprite Deck 2 function, which is Sprite uh, the code, probably. And if, if you actually zoom on this lower portion of the code, um, it feeds it to Sprite Decode, and then it computes the color for that. And Sprite Decode is this, this weird function, modulo floor. And what this does basically is, is it just takes an integer and it de decomposes it um, into a sequence of bits. Which means that all you have to do is, if you look at the Cloud Sprite, you take a row, you, you look at what the, 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 the bit sequence is, you encode that into an int, you store that in the code, and then when, when you need it, you just decompose it and recover just this array of bytes. So you can generate any array of bytes that you want. So when you uh, get a pixel that you know is on the cloud, you just look at what row, what row you need, what uh, bit you need. It's not really bits because they're, they go from one to three, but whatever. Um, and you associate every value to a color, and there you go, you got your sprite. So you can also hard code everything, like Mario, the, the brick, the pipe, the Koopa, everything is hard-coded using these integers. Um, so when I said that you don't have access to data, you kind of do, actually. It's just not as beautiful as, you, as you're used to. Um, so why did, why did I start looking at uh, Shinotoi? Um, as with anything that requires skills and creativity, usually people like to fight to <laughs> see who's the best. Um, so there was a Shinotoi competition at Seacraft uh, this year. Um, so the team was your favorite movie or game moment, and you, the team was announced one month before the event, and the winner was to be announced at Seagraph. And uh, actually the winner of the competition was the Mario shader uh, that I just showed, so it, so it is a very fine shader indeed. Um, so this was my submission, it's called Winning Solitaire 2, because so Winning Solitaire 1 didn't work, so I had to make another one. So it's the classic animation when in Windows uh, 95 when you win and the cards just start falling down. Um, so I'll just walk you quickly through um, the steps I had to achieve to make a shader do that. This is just my basic structure. Uh, it's just a bouncing sequence. That's really just, uh, I, I take the maximum of a bunch of parabolas with exponentially decreasing heights to have this feeling of the card losing energy as it bounces. Um, and I just take a floor of it to have this stepping uh, geometry come out. And so if you look at one of the, the cards on the side, you can clearly see this, the, the, the stepping function. Um, I didn't use ray marching, because um, I thought I could get away with ray uh, tracing, so that's what I used. Um, this is basically just, just a, it's kind of like a box. You have one side here, one side on the front, and one side on the top. So if you ray trace and you hit the side, it's easy to detect if you have an intersection or not. If you're between those two uh, step curve, you have an intersection. If you're in the red region, you don't. Uh, same thing for the front, very easy, because of the function. The function gives you the height of the card, so if you're 
within range of the card you have an, inter an intersection, so it's fine. But the hard part is if you have a ray coming from the top, you have all of those small steps that you have to uh, intersect with, so it's, it's just the intersection with a whole bunch of planes. Um, and so I didn't want to just take the, inter the intersection with everything. So what I did instead, um, instead of intersecting with the step function, I just intersect first with the smooth function. Um, so that's very easy. I have like something like 10 bumps, so it's just intersecting with uh, 10 parabolas. So I get a, a first estimation for my hit. I keep that, I retract the ray, and then I only intersect with the steps that are within a neighborhood of, of my first estimation, and then I compute the real intersection with that. So only restricting to that, um, it did the job. It's not perfect. Uh, I'll talk about the artifacts later, but uh, it allowed to run at 60 FPS, so I was, I was happy with it. Um, then the animation part, uh, to have this feeling of the card actually falling down, um, all I had to do is just to modify the, basically the front and back clipping planes for, for my geometry. So I think that describes it uh, very easily. So I've, I, I start by just moving the front plane forward. When it reaches the maximum distance, I start moving the back plane. And when they reach, I just stop rendering this geometry. I think the, the effect is exactly what I wanted. Um, I also wanted to have some periodic randomness. I, I, I don't know why it's, it's actually simple, but I struggled with that. Um, so I wanted to have like uh, cards going in all sorts of, di of directions. And I didn't want to hard code a, a whole bunch of random values. So I, I needed something that was different for each stack of cards, but that would uh, stay the same, keep the same value during a, start, a stack animation. Because if you have a, start, a stack of cards going this way and then the direction changes during the rendering, uh, it it's doesn't look good at all. Um, so I just used that instead of having just a sign function of very high fre frequency of time, I use a sign function of very high frequency, but of time divided by the period, and you take a floor. So for every time between zero and period, you'll get the exact same value. And by playing with the, the seed parameter here, you can get different values for different uh, stacks of cards. Um, and so I, I use this function to basically jitter everything, the stack direction, the stack origin, the card that is shown on, on the face of the card, the bounce height. Um, and I also had to control um, the direction of the, of the stack was not completely random. It was oriented towards the viewer, or else you just have cards flying everywhere, and you'd see most, mostly cards going away from you, and it, it didn't look as good. Um, and of course, the fun part was drawing all of those faces. That's definitely what took the, the, the most work. Um, so I, I, thinking about it, I, I could have just encoded all of those sprites in integers like, like they did with the Mario shaders. Um, but I, I have cards just falling towards the camera, and I didn't want to have this like, blocky um, aspect. I really wanted to have infinite resolution. So what I did is I computed an implicit function for each one of those symbols that was positive in the inside and negative in the outside. So for instance, for the spade and the five, this is really just like a bunch of lines, a bunch of circles. This is a circle here. It's stretched. So it's just manually tweaking those functions to get an, ana an analytic function that is positive inside, negative outside. So I can zoom as much as I want. Um, and I, I get just very nice results. So it was especially hard to do it for the faces, the jack, the queen, and the king. Um, but still, the construction is very simple. Like the, the lips here, there's this kind of bent arc shape that I use everywhere. It's just the intersection of two circles. So it's, it's trivial to do. Um, the top of the crown is just an absolute value function that you take the modulo of. So you get a bunch of copies of small p's. Um, and the hair is, again, this. Uh, it's the same thing as the lips. But I add a sign function on top of it. And then you just rotate it, copy it the other way. And you get something that kind of looks like hair if you look very uh, quickly. Um, and then the complicated part with those, uh, with the faces, is that actually with, the, um, with the, the symbols, it's either black or white. So I just needed one function. But for the faces, I have different colors. So how, how did I do that? Um, especially since I have regions that are inside more than one um, functions. So I just used the good old painter's algorithm. Start the pixel as white, then if you're, are you inside the face? Yes, then you become beige. 
are you inside the hair, then you become brown. And so I just uh, override the previous color um, to have like, the, I can have like, these layers, layered structures um, for my faces. And I'm actually very happy with the results. Um, I really like the king, he's very angry. Um, it, it's a bit, it's programmer's art, but does the trick, I think. Um, and I, I also like this one. If you remember the original deck of cards from Windows 95, um, kind of looks like it. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. For future, I, I put work in quotes, because it's, it's not really work, but. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, so I think better lighting and better shadows would definitely help. Here it's hard to know if the cards are really uh, touching the ground or not. But you have like this bouncing behavior, so you intuitively have the feeling that they're touching the ground, so it's not that bad. In Windows 95, they have the shadow in the case. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, Windows 95 did have like global illumi illumination on their cards. Um, but I, I tried using like just very simple shadows, but because you have cards every, everywhere, you, the, the shadows would just mess with, mess, mess with your brain and you don't understand what's happening, so I just left it there for the competition. Um, I also have a, a bunch of compilation problems. Uh, it's using WebGL, which is OpenGL ES. So it compiles on some browsers, but it doesn't compile on others. Um, no idea why, and nobody in the comments knew why, so eh, web technology. Um, these are the, art the artifacts that I have to solve that I talked about. Um, so because I, I use this, uh, this hack that I first intersect with the smooth geometry instead of before inter intersecting the, the steps, um, you see here along this edge, um, the geometry is the geometry of the smooth function. And that's because my smooth function is not a bounding volume of the step function, it's really just an approximation of it. Um, so you have problems here, but I, I feel like in the, in the bigger picture, and the res resolution is not that big, so you don't really see the difference. Um, there are also some artifacts here. You can see some green pixels, so there are some rays that uh, just traverse through the cards. But I mean, it's fairly minor, and, and you have so many cards just falling every everywhere that you don't really see it, so good enough. Um, and I could push the, the complexity. I'm, everything, it compiles very slowly, but it runs at 60 FPS, no problem. So I could have a whole bunch of thing add, uh, things. I don't really know what, but there's still some room for activities. Uh, special thanks to David. Actually, the story is that um, the, like four hours before the, the deadline, I get an email by the moderator saying, yeah, your shader is not compiling on this version of Chrome, so we're taking it down. Taking it down. So I'm just completely just panicked, and I called David. I, call I need David. you to make some beta tests for me. Tests tests for me. Tests 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 as many brothers as you can. So thanks for being there for me. Um, and that's it. Thank you.